It's no secret that network transformation is at the core of telecom providers' success for the future. As Tony Thomas, Windstream CEO, shared in his exclusive interview with ISE Magazine, quote, every network company is now two companies in one, a construction company and a software company. You must be great at both. Building networks and providing software solutions that make the network solution more valuable, end quote. Indeed, change is at the heart of everything related to network transformation. Still, one thing remains constant. Investing in your own professional development is the only way to remain relevant in the telecom ICT industry. That's why the ISE brand is committed to sharing network-related education, deployment best practices, insights from industry leaders, and the latest solutions and technologies that help you do your job better while you advance your career. Over the next three days, ISE Expo 2019 will deliver all those things. But don't stop there. Continue your learning each day by reading how your colleagues solve their network pain points in the ICT Visionary Series. Soak in the knowledge from Executive Insights interviews. 2019 will be the year that we see 5G really changing the way people live, work, learn, and play. Learn from provider vendor educational videos. Connect the launch cable to the COM port. Ensure the OTR mini jumper is connected to port A. Listen to webinars and podcasts from subject matter experts. Find products and solutions in our online buyer's guide. The ISE brand is your partner in transformation. From live events to consistently fresh education delivered in print, online, and your mobile device, it's all there for the taking. Of course, we couldn't do it without the many network providers and sponsors supporting our efforts in bringing the best professional development tools to you. A very special thank you to our Tech Talk sponsors, Corning, Scient, Henkels & McCoy, and Mastec for sponsoring our executive Tech Talks. We are pleased to create a trade show that supports your professional development efforts. Continue your commitment to learning by subscribing to ISE Magazine at www.isemag.com via print, digital, online, live events, and more. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Thank you from the ISE team, your partner in network transformation education. Please welcome ISE Magazine's Editorial Director, Sharon Bowman. Good morning. <laughs> welcome to the final day of ISE Expo. Over the last several years, the second day of our keynote, the Tech Talks have been very, very well received. So we're doing it again this year, and they have fantastic topics that they want to share with you. Topic one is Digital Transformation of Carrier Culture by Windstream. Topic two is Network Modernization at Scale by Verizon. And topic three is Cloud Connectivity and the Endless Backbone Opportunity by Talia Carrier. Very importantly, we want to make this presentation engaging, so please consider texting your questions to Q4OISE Expo, and we'll address the questions as we can at the end. Now, let's get started. Art Nichols is Vice President of Architecture and Technology at Windstream. He has responsibility for network evolution, hardware and software certification, and technical product development for all business units and technical disciplines in the company. A 20-year veteran of the telecom industry, Nichols has been instrumental in developing numerous products including IPTV, cloud security, SD-WAN, as well as advancing the evolution of the company's broadband, packet optical, and SDN-enabled network. He is active in numerous industry communities including the Metro Ethernet Forum and a governing board member of the Open Network Automation Platform as well as the Technical Advisory Committee with the FCC. Good morning. I uh, appreciate you guys having me. appreciate ISE having me this morning. Um, normally I'd have a fairly technical topic to cover with the group. Um, I decided to go a little different direction though this time and talk about maybe no less complex um, but a less technical discussion on that of corporate culture. Um, so I hope you guys will indulge me a bit this morning. Quick show of hands. Who has seen an episode or 
any of Stranger Things. Wow, that's pretty good. 100% participation in the panelists. Um, about six months ago or so, my youngest son came to me, and uh, he was adamant. All of his friends had uh, had watched Stranger Things, and he wanted to watch Stranger Things. And being the occasionally con conscientious dad that I am, um, I decided I needed to watch it first. And so, you know, a week later, after multiple binging sessions, I had made my way through the entire uh, series, and I was hooked. Um, and it's a great show. I'd highly recommend it to you if you hadn't seen it already. Um, the thing that my kids loved about it was, you know, it's a coming of age story about change, uh, and it has demogorgons, and who doesn't love a good demogorgon? Um, the thing that I loved about it was it was nostalgic, uh, and it took me back as a child of the 80s to, you know, a lot of things that I hadn't seen in a long time. These are actually some photos from uh, the actual season three that takes place set in the fictitious Starwood Mall. Um, Radio Shack was my first job in high school, so that's very nostalgic for me. Orange Julius, uh, unquestionably still the single best sugary drink, uh, with apologies to Jolt Cola and Mountain Dew. Uh, Walden Books and Sam Goodies um, may strike a chord for you. You know, I found it ironic that um, Netflix, who produced and, and uh, distributed Stranger Things, and companies like them had a strong role in the demise of both these companies and you know the, the related industries they're in. And we're all, obviously, every industry is in a period of disruption. I think that's, that's pretty clear. Telecom is, is certainly no uh, exception to that. I, I love this quote by uh, Jeff Bezos that I'm sure many of you have seen in his um, now famous uh, annual shareholder, shareholder's letter about the dangers um, of falling out of the startup mentality, of falling into what happens next. You know, these really strong terms, excruciating, painful decline followed by death. And so we have to guard against that. Now, telecom, you know, is a greater than 140-year-old industry, so it's not exactly as if we're in a startup mode. Um, in a lot of ways, we've uh, evolved and built a lot of strong processes and governance and efficiencies, and we've done things that you do when you grow up and ma you mature. But as we're being disrupted, how then do you go, is it possible, the question? Is it possible to turn back the calendar? Is it possible to turn back the clock and be... Uh, be an innovative company without losing you know, who you are. Um, and so this morning I wanted to talk a little bit about um, not necessarily a recipe or some prescriptive formula to tackle that. I couldn't do that in 15 minutes anyway. But you know, through my discovery investigation, and, and actually there's a lot of really good uh, materials, uh, Facebook's Telecom Infrastructure product, Project and their working group around people and processes uh, put together a lot of good materials on this. Spotify is a good example of uh, sort of a cloud company that's done a lot of work to expose how they operate internally. And so I just wanted to kind of highlight some what I thought were important um, sort of aspects of trying to, to go through this process of rolling the clock, clock back, becoming more innovative, uh, improving your culture. The first one here, establish a North Star. Um, oftentimes we get defocused or unfocused on so many things that it's difficult to, to look through and determine what am I not gonna compromise on? What is so important to my business? What am I going to be the best at, in, best in class in my space, in my business? Um, establishing that North Star, making sure everybody's on the same page, everybody understands. If you guys saw Tommy Thomas, I'm sure, actually didn't make it yesterday, but if you did, I'm sure he talked a little bit about um, getting, you know, Windstream on this um, path towards being a software powerhouse um, and connecting people. Those are things that are, are North Stars to us. Uh, and so it's really important that we establish a North Star um, as a, a corporate culture. Servant leadership, um, you know, for a long time in industrial age, uh, the model of management and leadership is this kind of tailorist, uh, hierarchical, flow down uh, approach where you beat your, your team into submission um, and you measure them continually. Uh, and in a knowledge-based economy, that's not necessarily uh, the, the model that works best. And so I'm sure you've heard servant leadership and have a, a connotation of you know, things like upside down org charts and these sorts of things. But it's, it's so true when we're trying to build innovation from bottoms up. Leaders have great ideas and leaders can impart vision for those ideas, but ultimately they don't execute those vision. They don't bring innovation. That has to come from bottoms up. And so how we um, enable um, the teams within our, within our organizations, uh, how we serve those teams, um, having uh, qualities like empathy, like self-awareness, uh, are hugely important, like a servant-minded heart, um, are hugely important to how 
um, leadership is effective in, in driving through innovative culture and innovative vision um, in tomorrow's organization. Small teams is hugely important. These guys have saved the world three times already. Um, so imagine what grown-ups can do. You know, it's not, if you've ever been on a conference call with 50 people, how much you got accomplished, right? That same sort of principle applies universally to our larger organization. Um, small teams are where the real heavy lifting occurs. And so it's incumbent on us as leaders in, in our industries and in our, in our corporations to empower those small teams, to give them uh, the freedom, to give them the challenge, show them vision, and give them the reins and authority to, to do what they can do best um, in a small team environment. Uh, in, in some respects, there's a lot of models for how do you take that organizationally. There's a lot of structures for how do you take innovation and lift it across your organization. Um, you can buy a startup, right, and leave them as a whole separate entity. Um, you can try to improve processes or improve one area across multiple you know, parts of your organization. Um, the model that we've seen the most success with and that we're trying to, to adopt within Windstream is one of uh, sort of seeding innovation back into the organization. Again, we're trying to transform the entire company into a software powerhouse, not just a small organization. So if, if we build a small group made up of small teams um, and leave that separate, are we really changing the organization? Taking the, that innovative mindset, taking that, that culture and pushing it back into the larger, each of the individual organizations is really what we, we feel like is the, the, the best approach. This might be potentially the, the most important one uh, in my estimation. Um, again, as companies, as telcos, we've built efficiency. We've built compliance and governance and structure and controls to make sure our organizations operate efficiently. Um, that's not necessarily conducive to innovation uh, within its own right. And so our, our normal reaction I've seen, uh, and in fact, I, I think I've participated in many times, is when a new novel idea comes up, we sort of whack-a-mole it. In, in the sense of, uh, well, what can I do to build governance around that? How do I build that in my back office? What am I gonna do with all of my processes and people and systems to make sure um, we sort of telco, telcoize that, so to speak? Um, that has an opposite effect or, of expanding innovation. So we have to be intentional about protecting that level of innovation within our companies and, our, and as leaders within those companies, it's extremely important. Um, know your rock stars. I'll, I'll give you a quick hint that you know, vice presidents of technology are not the rock stars within the, the corporation, within your organizations. Um, it's the folks on the front lines that are, that are really uh, knocking it out of the park. You, you have to identify those guys. Um, the classical model for uh, growth career pathing within organizations of, oh, he's a great individual contributor, let's put him on a track to management. When in, ma in fact, he may not be uh, you know, a good manager of people. He may not even desire, he or she may not desire to be a good manager of people. And so we have to create other career paths, both from a compensation perspective uh, and really from a, um, the, the emphasis that these guys get within, the, within your companies, within our companies. Um, they should be hallowed as they walk the halls, so to speak. They should be the rock stars within your company, not necessarily all of our leaders. Embrace risk probably goes without saying. Um, we all have to become more comfortable with uh, taking more risk, taking more challenges, pushing the envelope. If we're to be innovative, sometimes things fail. Uh, I've not yet adopted the, the sort of mindset within Silicon Valley of some of uh, celebrating failure. I think there's things we can learn from failure. Um, the biggest is keep driving forward. Take the, the lessons that, that each of the risks that you've taken and improve and, and keep moving quickly. So I wanted to talk just briefly about kind of what that looks like and an example of what we've seen some of these innovative and cultural changes within Windstream. Um, about two years ago, we kicked up uh, a small team that we um, titled uh, under Project Kailash. And I won't bother you with all the details of what the name means, but um, it's a small team ch challenged with uh, developing a programmable network um, from, from ground up to, uh, to, to meet the needs of a, an evolving culture and evolving network. These are the two mantras that that team came away with uh, and continues to operate under this, to this day. Do more awesome and make networks accessible. Uh, you'll note it's do more awesome, it's not buy more awesome, it's not plan more awesome, it's actual doing work, right? It's, it's, it's all about the business of um, bringing things to, to fruition. And then make next networks accessible. I wanna talk a little bit about what that means, what that looks like. 
So these are the alphabet suit that our industry is famous for, quite honestly, of pushing in front of customers, particularly enterprise and business customers, um, exposing the complexity of how we do networking, of how networking works. Um, I'm sure, you know, if you're an IT admin, if you're a network engineer, many of you, I'm sure, if not most of all of you, know many of these acronyms and, and know what they mean and understand. But I think we've done a disservice to our industry uh, and to our customers to expose this complexity. Really what's required is to take the complexity that exists under the covers and simplify it, to make it simple for our, for our end users. That's what they want. And so these are the, the principles that we, um, within the Project Kailash, adhere to that we demand uh, for any service for anything that we're, we're developing to be able to use it anywhere um, from any, you know, not having to wait on anyone, using it yourself, um, you control quality. These are also the same principles that we apply to the internal development team itself. So not only are we, challenge, are we challenging ourselves to make sure our customers have these things in anything that we develop, we're also challenging the rest of our organization and this team to make sure that they're empowered to have these things um, at their disposal, that they understand it's, it's under their control of quality. Um, it's under their control to make it better. There's a lot I could get into, and again, we don't have an, enough time to get into all the technicals of uh, what this programmable network has, has kind of evolved to be, uh, and it's in our production network today, but I did want to just high level kind of touch on what this looks like from a hierarchical level. So we kind of think about it in terms of what, what are the tenets of the Kailash network or of our programmable network within Windstream. Uh, there's three core tenets, the operator um, that's operating the network itself, subscribers who are taking advantage of that network are exposed um, the capabilities of the network, either via API or, or other user interface, and then service providers that the subscriber ultimately gives control and allots the ability for um, the service provider to, to uh, manage the network on their behalf. It ultimately is the subscriber's network. They determine what data is exposed to the service providers. They determine um, how, to, how to manage their network. And so that's maybe a little abstract and tough to explain, tough to, to understand. I, I wanna maybe try to drive it home with an analogy. Tomorrow I'll uh, dial up an Uber, uh, I don't know if I'll dial it up, I'll use my cell phone to, to uh, get an Uber arranged for a flight to, or, or drive to DFW. And they do a great job, Uber in this case, of estimating how long is it gonna take for me to get from the Omni Hotel to DFW. They estimate all the traffic, they you, you know, figure out all the, the variables to, uh, I'm sure there's a machine learning algorithm behind that that's, that's ultimately driving out how long is it gonna take. But what they can't do is make it any better. Right, they don't have control of the street lights. They don't have control of where police officers are gonna be. They don't have control of the traffic itself. But imagine for a moment if they did have that control. If they were given, say, API access to turn off, make all the green lights, all of the red lights between here and DFW green, to take away all the tolls um, you know, on, the, on the entire path, to remove traffic. That's essentially what we're trying to do with our own network, expose control uh, from a prioritization perspective, ex expose control from uh, blocking, shaping, policing, all of the mechanism that, mechanisms that we know and love from an IP MPLS standpoint, from an SD-WAN perspective, expose those to the end user um, and do, do that in a, in a really simplified way. It's not only enough to make the network programmable, you also have to build a factory uh, around it. And so that's really what all the principles of um, continuous integration and continuous development, to be able to to build, test, deploy in an automated fashion um, all of the functions that we're, we're trying to in, in, um, integrate into the network. And so it's, our challenge is not necessarily um, just around the network functions themselves, is to make it automated uh, from day one. And that's the huge sort of force, force, force multiplier um, that enables this to, be, to grow and be a cloud native platform. I should mention this is 100% cloud native. This is how we think Google would develop a network if they were coming into a uh, green space, greenfield sort of telco environment, built on all the sort of things that you would expect cloud native to mean, Kubernetes and Kafka and so on and so forth. And so we're very proud of what we've done thus far, but what I'm really excited about is what this can accomplish with the culture that we've been able to foster thus far um, on doing more awesome. You know, from a subscriber perspective, this might be one way we think about what that could look like. I want my Stranger Things to always be Ultra HD on my Fire Stick. A very tangible way, right, to, to understand how to consume this programmable network that we're, that we're trying to build. And the network must conform to it. So we think that's kind of a Stranger Network. 
Um, and that's empowered and made possible by a bit of a stranger culture. And I would certainly invite and challenge you guys uh, to do the same types of things uh, in your own organization. Thank you. George Riggins leads a team with global responsibility for engineering the IP network supporting Verizon Wireless and Verizon Wireline with connectivity to over 2,600 cities. This includes Verizon's industry-leading Intelligent Edge network and core MPLS networks serving 99% of the Fortune 1000 companies. Additionally, George leads the engineering of Verizon's Fios Backbone, the most advanced 100% fiber to the home network in America. And having served as an attack helicopter pilot and war planner in the United States Army, George joined Verizon as a central office engineer. George holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science and General Engineering from the United States Military Academy at West Point and a Master of Business Administration from Loyola University. George Karatsis leads a team that designs, implements, and optimizes Verizon's fiber networks in the Southwest region. George's team supports customer enterprise and wholesale customers and is responsible for planning and designing the outside plant fiber networks that support all of Verizon's services. Prior to this role, George was the Director of Technology responsible for engineering functions related to the Verizon Cloud Platform, Virtual Network Services, and VoIP Services Network. He was also responsible for technical facility power and cooling standards and technical support. Before joining Verizon, George began his telecommunications career as a communications specialist in the United States Air Force. Good morning, everyone. And, um, Thank you. With all due apologies to anyone in the audience who may be a Seinfeld fan, uh, welcome to the session of George. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't start off by thanking Janice and Sharon and the entire ISE team for having us here and giving us an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing at Verizon to modernize the network at scale. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, how we got to where we are today, and I think this is a story that, that will resonate with most folks in the audience. Uh, you know, over a, a series of mergers and acquisitions and builds from the ground up, uh, over many a year, we found ourselves with numerous networks that we were maintaining um, uh, around the globe, a massive scale in terms of numbers of uh, routers and network elements that had different software releases, different security issues, different uh, capabilities. Uh, you know, we're, we're transiting roughly 200,000 terabytes of data across our networks. Uh, today, and we found ourselves in a position where we needed to be able to move forward with one, uh, with a simplification of our network architecture to be able to support the new products and services that we are moving forward with. And so that's what led to the uh, original uh, thought process behind how do we develop this intelligent edge network that takes advantage of all of the, uh, the promise of software-defined networking that we've heard for a few years and, and actually puts it into use. How do we uh, you know, separate, truly separate the uh, control and user plane uh, and, and be able to uh, chart more of our own course about how we want to manage the network in order to be able to support ultimately our end customers and provide those innovative products and services that, uh, that, that they demand from us. Uh, so what you see here on the chart is a, uh, is a depiction, whoop, what you see here on the chart, <laughs> it's a uh, depiction of where we're headed with the, uh, with the build that we're moving forward with. So starting from, uh, from the left, the access options. So we, we wanted to simplify the options that we have for deploying or for providing services to our customers. Uh, and you can see there uh, the access options that this architecture will support, 5G and LTE, dark fiber, uh, direct to customers, uh, optical waves, uh, uh, ELAN, uh, E-Line, uh, layer three VPN, and, and just plain internet access. 
Um, and, and to underpin those access options, we are deploying a massive amount of fiber that uh, George here, uh, George two, will be uh, pro providing an, over, uh, an overview of the, uh, the, the fiber architecture that we're deploying. Um, j it, this is massive at scale. We already have about 900,000 route miles of fiber in the ground today. Uh, well, not necessarily just in the ground, but aerial as well. Um, and uh, we're, we're deploying about 1,400 route miles every month uh, in order to support the layer zero, the, the physical infrastructure that underpins the, uh, the rest of the Intelligent Edge network. On top of that, then we were lighting that fiber with uh, a couple of uh, methodologies, uh, either with our NGPON2 uh, deployment, and uh, some of you may have seen the announcement that we made yesterday uh, in concert with Calix, uh, our ability to test up to 34 gigabit per second on NGPON2. Um, and our packet optical network that we're deploying, our unified transport network that gives us the ability to extend MPLS all the way out to the very bitter edge of the network uh, without having to hairpin in and out of routers. We're taking advantage of the ability to combine the, uh, uh, the optical layer one and packet at layers two, two and a half MPLS, depending on how you define that. Um, we are deploying also a multi-service edge router that will uh, give us the ability to provide services to all of our um, uh, all of our underlying uh, uh, companies. Um, so that gives us the ability to provide and segregate things like pr uh, private IP traffic from public IP traffic. Gives us the ability to serve uh, all of the lines of business that we have uh, and the customer base uh, from one router rather than having to build multiple bespoke uh, routed networks. Uh, that then uh, is all cared for by our global converged core, uh, which gives us a, uh, you know, in the, in the environment that we were in a few years ago, we had multiple core networks uh, around the globe. We successfully converged all those into one uh, global converged core. Um, at this point, I'm going to throw the floor over to uh, George. All right, so it, it, it occurred to us uh, yesterday we're at rehearsal when we were kind of blocking who gets up and who talks that I am literally standing between two ferns. So those of you who don't get the reference, go YouTube that later, it's hilarious. Uh, those of you that do get the reference, I found out later at dinner dis very disappointingly that ISC couldn't afford Zach Galifianakis, so you got two Georges instead. Um, so to really kind of dive more deeply into the new network architecture that, that George was talking about, um, it really does require deep fiber um, and flexibility at the access edge. And uh, it, one of the, the primary use cases, it's probably the foundational use case for uh, our deep fiber deployment is wireless. Um, so whether you're deploying uh, 4G small cells, 5G, uh, it, it's really important to take your spectrum, you wanna drive spectrum efficiency, high bandwidth, low late, uh, latency applications, you have to have uh, a very deep fiber network uh, for the front hall and the back hall uh, for wireless. So um, that is really our foundational use case uh, for, for fiber. Um, you layer on top of that, we, we tend to uh, densify wireless based on usage. And a really neat thing is that where people are, are using their cell phones, you tend to have a lot of small and medium businesses. So why not leverage that same asset and uh, provide hand, high bandwidth services to businesses using the NGPON2 uh, architecture that George spoke about earlier. On top of that, if you design this correctly, you can also leverage that, uh, that investment to, uh, to really sell, uh, lease uh, any excess capacity we have to other, other companies that, that, that believe in a similar strategy but may not have the, uh, the, the desire or the capability to build their own network. 
All right, so what does fiber densification look like? Um, this is, we'll call this random city USA. Um, if it looks like a whole lot, if it looks like a city you recognize, I deny all allegations, this is fi Fiber City USA. And what you see there with the 3G and 4G network is, is a typical wireless deployment. Um, you have a bunch of macro sites, uh, you know, just some fiber connecting them and that, that coverage at that uh, band of spectrum is, is sufficient. When you start to really layer in though, um, 4G densification with small cells, uh, and 5G, which at this point is really a millimeter wave play, and you all know about the propagation characteristics and how you really have to densify your, your 5G radios uh, to get the coverage that you need. Uh, you wind up with what you see there on the right, um, which is essentially 100 times more fiber than you needed in the past. So that's, that's, that's significant. Um, so you know, when we look at, that, that's what it looks like, and uh, when you consider you know, how, how are we doing, how is Verizon doing relative to, to our plan to do this right here? Um, you know, George mentioned uh, we are at a cadence now of about 1,400 route miles a month. Uh, that's across 60 cities. Um, and if you want to put that into perspective, the circumference of the Earth is 25,000 miles. That means that 1,400 miles, route miles a month we are circling the globe every 18 months with fiber. So that, to me, that ma makes it kind of more real. So we're, and then if you want to take that even deeper, if you, if you care about fiber miles, this is predominantly 864-strand uh, cable, uh, and now increasingly 1,728-strand cable. So a tremendous amount of route miles and, and just a, a high level of capacity within those route miles. Um, you know, so we're very proud of that. We have a lot more work to do. Uh, this is not easy. This is not easy at all. Um, you know, for Verizon, uh, Art mentioned this, the, the, the startup mentality. Um, nobody really thinks of Verizon as a startup, but in these markets, we're doing this. For example, Random City USA, we don't, we're, we're the new guy. We're not the predominant provider. Um, the ILEC, however you want to think of it, we're coming into a lot of new markets uh, some of them, quite frankly, without even an employee in place. And we're saying we want to do this, right? So you guys, we want to do this over a two to three year period, um, go. You can't do that by being encumbered by processes and systems and tools. All those things are really hard to develop, take time to really get good at them. You have to be agile. Um, so that's a challenge for sure. Um, you know, imagine if you are, um, if you're, uh, in, you're a resident of uh, Random City USA, and we come to you and say, we want to do this to your city. This is construction. This is essentially, you know, depending on, on how, much, how much of it's aerial versus underground, you're coming into this community and you are proposing to basically dig up their, their city. Um, so that becomes a challenge. I think the scale of what we're doing is, is simply unprecedented. Um, you want to, all of that build requires permitting. Um, I assure you, none of the permitting agencies we deal with are prepared to provide us permits at the scale we need to do this, right? So, um, and we have no relationship with those permitting agencies because we're the new guy. So to get to essentially circling the globe every 18 months uh, with route, with 1,400 uh, a month route miles of fiber, to me has been extremely impressive. Um, and I would say it's, uh, you know, how, how do you do that? Um, you know, I would say it's a few things. Uh, my boss likes to say, likes to say um, it's, it's donuts and hugs. Uh, you really have to, what we mean by that is that you're building relationships with these permitting agencies and with these cities. Um, leveraging, it, it really does take a village, quite frankly, uh, to, to, to do this quickly. Um, engineers, um, our business development team uh, coming in and doing private partner, uh, private public partnership deals with some of these cities, um, some of our lobbyists, just to make sure that we're heard at local government, um, and if need be, our, our, our legal arm as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's hard work, um, but we've made progress. And I'd also like to just, just take a second to say, sometimes none of those things matter, and um, we struggle with Random City USA. And you have to simply engineer and be creative and think out of the box and figure out how you're going to overcome what is essentially a policy issue with engineering prowess. So 
you know, we have great partnerships with a lot of you in the room, um, and you help us make this happen. So, you know, we went to Corning when we first started this and said, hey, um, you know, how much fiber you got, <laughs> uh, and we'll take all of it. Um, you know, so similar with Prismian, um, and, you know, we, we've been, <laughs> we basically wanted owner's economics because we were so committed to this. We needed every bit of uh, inventory we could get our hands on. And uh, other, uh, you know, uh, I'd give a shout out to, uh, you know, I if I tried to acknowledge every, uh, every partner, I'd probably look like, I'd probably sound like a, a NASCAR driver with all my sponsors. And, but, um, you know, I, I, we had a vendor, I won't get into the details, but, you know, Comscope is one, came right out to, uh, to our site Tuesday. And we're like, hey, I need you to develop me a product right now to help me overcome a particular issue. You know, there we are with napkins and, and pens trying to figure out how we develop a product on the fly to come overcome some of these issues. So my point is, whether it's rallying our internal resources, developing relationships with these communities, uh, and, and having good partners out there, like many of you in the room, you know, that's how you make this happen. So we're really proud of that. And, uh, you know, we think this is, we know this is right for our business. We believe it's where the industry has to go uh, to enable new technologies and new revenue streams. And uh, we believe we're leading the charge. I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out, though, that I am not his boss and have never said anything about donuts or hugs. <laughs> <laughs> there were no donuts or hugs with you, I assure you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. With two decades of expert insight, Matthias Friedstrom strives to educate and challenge the status quo when it comes to network technology and the essential role carriers and their partners play in our connected world. Located in Stockholm, Sweden, Matthias first joined Telia AB in December of 1996. In 1998, he assumed the role within Telia International Carrier as head of the construction and implementation of the international network within Europe and USA for the carrier business. Between 2003 and 2010, Matthias headed up the product management side of Telia Sonera International Carrier for voice IP capacity and infrastructure related services. Between January 2011 and June 2016, Matthias was the CTO of Telia Sonera International Carrier. Since July 2016, he is now the chief evangelist for Telia Carrier. Matthias holds an MSc in Electrical Engineering from the University of Wollongong, Australia. Okay, so thank you very much for here, and, and of course a big thanks to ISC who's having me here, you know, coming from, from the other side of the water. It's, it's a big thing for us being able to be presenting here. Uh, I'll sort of start just by, you know, these guys, you know them very well. They're American companies, are super big, just to give you the flavor of who we are. Uh, when I see the 5G fiber maps, I can see that. That kind of relates me back to the 1998-2002 era when everyone was digging like crazy. We were one of the crazy companies digging like crazy at that time. And, and sort of everything we live on today is all the fibers we digged in those days. Now I can see that happening again. You know, we need to dig up the streets everywhere, and that's going to be a big thing again. Uh, hopefully we'll do it much smarter this time. I'm sure we will. Uh, last time we were just digging absolutely everywhere. Every meeting was about drawing lines on a, on a piece of map and, and you do it. But I represent a company that's sort of a big operator carrier. Uh, about 60% or 59% of the global internet is behind our network if you look at the internet route. So that's kind of where we come from. You know, we're a big global internet provider. Uh, owns our own fiber backbone in US and in Europe uh, and, and so on. So that's sort of kind of the background really. And what I'm going to talk about is what type of new demands do we see on ourselves uh, going forward, you know? What is it that we need to change in our company? And what does the industry need to change? Because there's a lot of things happening in there. And, and you see the logos on this slide and you kind of almost understand immediately that all of them are really changing the way we have to build our network, the way enterprises have to build their network and the way we all need to think about when we build network. Uh, and that's kind of what I wanted to, uh, to talk about. Uh, and basically, the, I would say the major and the biggest change is, of course, the cloud. That, you know, earlier you had your servers in your basement at your headquarters and that was fine. And all the circuits that you were building were going from somewhere in the world back to the headquarters where you used all the servers there. Now, if you look at a normal enterprise and the way they will 
build their network and they will run their network is that 80% of that traffic is not gonna go back that same route. It's gonna go towards some cloud application or it's gonna go to some other applications that's, in, that's somewhere else, not on your own premises. And that is of course a huge challenge to how we all need to build our network. Uh, we can't just rely on the old way of connecting everything back to the headquarters. We need to find new ways of doing this, of course. And then on top of this, uh, we can see that using the public internet for this type of traffic may not be a bad idea. It can actually be quite a good idea. Uh, you know, obviously there are, and I will come into this later on, but if you look what Gartner says, Gartner says that about 70% of the traffic from smaller offices will go via public internet. So I'm gonna think about, you know, what is it, what, what type of challenge does that come to if, if you're gonna use the public internet for all these type of services? And obviously if you look at the public internet, there is a lot of advantages, but there's also some challenges. And of course, I would say the biggest advantage is of course that the coverage is really everywhere. Uh, public internet, you know, if you, if you connect to it, you can, and, and the whole point with internet is that you can reach everything everywhere all over the world. So of course that's a huge advantage and you know anyone having a cloud service can actually put that service on the public internet and practically everyone in the world can reach it. So of course from that point of view it's a great thing. The second thing is of course the price. Uh, the, the price you pay by connecting to the public internet is quite low. Uh, you can have a broadband connection at home and it, you don't pay that much for it. Uh, and you get access to all these fantastic things in that network. So basically everything with the public internet supports this cloud thinking, you know, I can just put something in there and people can share what I'm putting there. But of course there's a backside to this, of course. Public internet is best effort. It is always gonna be best effort. Uh, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's hard to complain if it doesn't work because it is best effort. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing we see is also that the way traffic is flowing on the public internet it's not always the most perfect way for the traffic itself. It should be based on other things. It should be much more based on economical terms. You know, I got a better price by sending my traffic that direction instead of that direction, although I know that it should really go that direction. So of course there is this economical thing around this, you know, that's kind of, you know, routing is much more based on economics than the way traffic should really flow. And then of course the big thing that we we don't really know anything about, but there is a lot of politics in there. There is a lot of discussions around, you know, what happens if this country is shutting themselves out of internet, what happens here and there. So there's a lot of things on the shady side of the internet as well that you need to be afraid of uh, and you need to be careful of. But basically, if you look at the public internet, uh, today it's about 70,000 networks connected together. Uh, all of them connected in some way or the other. Some are connected to more networks, others are connected only to a few networks. And of course, if you are thinking about putting your cloud services out on this public internet, you really need to think about who you're gonna use. Uh, the risk is that you find yourself and feel you know, okay, uh, I'm gonna use this cloud provider, but I'm also gonna use this local ISP here because I believe they have a very good price for my connection in there. That ISP may then be connected to some other and some other, and you suddenly see your traffic traveling around half of the globe. Uh, and that wasn't really the intention you wanted to find. So here the message is, you know, be super careful who you connect to when you connect to your either local ISPs or larger ISPs and so on. There are many traps you can fall into if you select the wrong providers here. The second thing is of course, there's a lot of companies out there offering cloud services, cloud connect services and so on. Uh, quite few of them actually own the network, their own network, and own the backbone of their own network. So what they do is they resell someone, ed someone other services. And that's also something you need to be careful because using the cloud is all about scaling up and down. And, and if you can't scale up, if, if the one you're buying services from constantly need to buy services in return to serve you, then you don't, need the you get, don't get the flexibility that you want. And, and that's also something you need to be careful of. So you might select the right ISP, but the ISPs itself or the cloud provider behind has not selected the perfect thing. So basically, you know, what I'm trying to say is there is a way to get this best effort in a really good way. You select an ISP, you understand the ISP is connected to this backbone, that backbone is actually connected to the cloud itself, perfect. Using that type of connection, public internet will be very good for you. 
it will be a low price, very good solution for you. Same thing, of course, you know, uh, the three companies of us up here and, and a few other companies are, of course, directly connected to many cloud services. So if you really feel, you know, I want to have the absolute best connection to the big cloud services, you can go direct to the backbone provider, the cloud provider. Of course, the cloud providers themselves have these direct access solutions. Uh, if you're in the vicinity of their data center, that might be the best solution to connect directly to them. But if you're far away, then you know there are some really good backbone providers that you can select and, and you get your services directly connected. Uh, of course, this is gonna cost you slightly more, but of, on the other hand, you know, the quality is gonna be so much better uh, uh, and therefore. So my message and, and the conclusion I have on this is that, you know, with the right selection of ISP and the right selection of backbone provider, public internet is not a very bad place to put your traffic in if you're looking for cloud services and connecting to the cloud. There are direct connect solutions, of course, and, the, and they're also really good, but it's, you know, public internet may not be that bad. Then, of course, that just solves one piece of connectivity. There are many other pieces that we need to solve as well. And of course, uh, when in the new world, when enterprises and others puts a lot of new demands on us, there is a lot of things we as an operator need to do here. Uh, and of course, the big one is of course, simplify everything. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of things from the guys before that we need to simplify. I think uh, yesterday we heard from Windstream that you know, simplifying everything with SD-WAN and SD-WAN that just works is the dream scenario for everyone. So of course, that's something we all need to work very hard on to achieve, uh, getting this to be very, very sweet. The second thing is, of course, we need to be super scalable. Uh, I've seen traffic patterns that goes from one day to the other scaling up 100%. And of course, we need to be ready. Uh, we can't just say, you know, oh, sorry, we need to buy this from someone else. We need to be there. We need to have that type of scalability in our network. And that's a big challenge, being super scalable. But that's the demand people have now. You know, uh, if suddenly, you know, I want to put a lot of uh, traffic into the cloud, we need to be there for them. Uh, I think the flexibility we talk about here uh, to future-proof the business, you know, in the old world, we dreamed about three to five year contracts all the time to secure our future. Uh, I don't think we can demand that anymore. I think the customers want to select the one they want to work with. And if that's not good after a week, we need to let them go and we need to sort of get them somewhere else. We need to convince them that we're so good to work with them. That's the new demand on enterprise and, and operators in the future, you know. If everything is gonna be very scalable and you can switch and choose, then of course the operators themselves need to be extremely flexible and, and, and even in the contract side, you know, we can't demand three year contracts anymore. And of course the dream scenario is of course that they never, you know, enterprise never really see the operator they work with. We make all the services transparent and they can upscale, downscale, do whatever they want with their services. That is of course a huge challenge for our industry to make all that stuff. We are used to taking an order and then progress everything and then six weeks later come back with here you are. Uh, I think we need to go away from that. We need to be extremely transparent going forward to show customers, you know, really. And then of course, one more thing that we need to be extremely good at is of course, we need all of us to realize that we can't do everything for everyone. Uh, there needs to be an ecosystem in there to support these type of clients, you know. Uh, I would be stupid if I said that security services and that type of stuff is something we can do better than the security companies themselves. No, we can't. So we need to work with these security companies on the internet, making sure that their functionality is synchronized with our functionality. There's a lot of IoT providers out there. We need to make sure that all the IoT providers are part of our ecosystem so that someone wants to use their solutions in our network or someone else's network, that will work as well. So there's a lot of things that needs to change right now. We need on one side to change the complete engine to make customers do whatever they want in the network based on, based on our network services. And on the other side, we need to work with the right partners. Uh, we need to work with the partners like here. You know, we can't build networks everywhere. We need to start to share, you know, we have network over here, they have network over there. Perfect, the combination of that is gonna be great. Uh, and the market is big enough for all of us. So, so hopefully that's gonna be really good. So basically a short summary of this is that the cloud thing itself is going to change absolutely everything. The complete way we run our network, the complete way we have our IT setup 
around our network as well. It is really, really changing, and that's something we all need to live with. Uh, I like the quote yesterday that, you know, it's never been as fast as it is today, but it's never as slow as it is today as well. You know, and, and that's something we absolutely have to adopt to. So basically the message to everyone is, you know, be prepared to re-architect, rethink the way you think about this. And, and then of course in the end, you know, we are sitting and thinking about, you know, what, do, what are we good at? What do we bring to the market? And what is someone else much better at? And who do we work with? Who should we really work with? You know, there are other companies that's better at doing this. Yeah, let's work with them. Some things we're really good at, let's do that. But let's not try to do everything for everyone. So with that, I, I conclude my, my talk. Thank you all very much. Very insightful stuff. And I love the, the variety of topics you covered. Thank you. Uh, we do have a few moments for questions. Uh, and unfortunately, not as much time as I would like. That said, I'm going to take a couple. You ready? Okay. Hold on. Sorry. Question to Verizon about expanding the MTLS network. We heard yesterday that SD WAN is the killer MTLS technology, and Gartner expects 90% of businesses will move to SD WAN by 2023. How do you respond to that? Uh, yeah, so that is absolutely in our roadmap. Um, the MTLS core that we have today won't be the MTLS core that we have a few years from now. Um, so uh, absolutely, we're, uh, we are roadmapping toward an SD-WAN, an open edge type architecture for the future. George, you want to add anything? No, I mean, it, 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 we're absolutely doing that. We're our, our, our product roadmap, the things we're selling to customer, we are embracing this change and, and adapting to it, for sure. Thank you. Here's one for Windstream. Being a technology company, what are the technologies you suggest your partners to be equipped with to support you? Wow, that's a good question. It is. Um, <laughs> the realm of technology is so broad, it's hard to answer. Uh, very discreetly, I would say increasingly um, software related technologies are, are where we need um, partnerships and assistance. Uh, so AI, ML, those sorts of things to increase our level of, level of automation, level of visibility, um, control of the networks that we run. Um, but we need partnerships and help really across the board. So whether it's in our case 5G for fixed wireless, uh, we're predominantly a wireline company uh, with a wireline history and we're attempting to move into a wireless uh, access mechanism and so obviously we need a lot of help in that arena um, but but really I don't the ecosystem is such that we need assistance and we need partners that come alongside us across the technology stack um, routing switching telephony security video uh, so on and so forth thank you um, for you all when it really comes down to it fiber has to be everywhere right so what are you doing to automate fiber field ops and maintenance, and are there any great answers out there? I think that's the real killer question, and <laughs> that's the dream scenario. If we right. can fix that, that would be great. I still think, and, and, and we heard yesterday as well, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's really difficult. Yes, you can locate the fiber faults much quicker, but then it comes down to manual things, you know, how to repair fibers. Obviously, we can build the network super resilient so that the traffic is flowing some some other way when there is a fiber break. But you know, getting rid of the fiber breaks that would be the dream come true for <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's really really hard. There are new ways of splicing fiber quicker and so on. So we see a lot of good things there, but that's still the biggest hassle we have. You know, these crazy fiber breaks. Uh, when you least expect them, that's when they happen. Great point. Really annoying. Anybody else want to respond to that? I think. From our point of view, n not repeating the sins of the past would, when you're building a network is important. So if you want to get into automation, if you want to uh, intelligent dispatching, um, automation even from a capacity perspective, you are, it's life and death if your inventory is correct or not. If, if you have good inventory, it's amazing what you can do. And if you don't, <laughs> you are, it's stuck in manual processes and, and dealing with discrepancies. So 
for our build, I know that is something that has our utmost attention as we build essentially a new fiber network um, to hopefully learn from the past and build a network that will lend itself to automation as we begin to consume it. Great point. Art, anything? No, I think you guys said it well. Very well said. We are out of time because the exhibit floor is opening. So with that, Mateus, would you mind doing the attendee uh, giveaway? I would very much like. This is a dream come true to do this. <laughs> 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 they fought over it, you guys. <laughs> and you get a clap. All right, so the numbers are 39, 55, 60, and 73. Oh, we have a winner. Oh, winner. There we have the winner. And your name, sir? Jake Greenwald from Ramtech. Congratulations. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you Thank all you. for being here. The exhibit floor is open. Thank you so much, Tech Talk pre presenters. Have a great day. That was Just really a few quick reminders. So well done. Remember to complete your entry card for the attendee vacation giveaway by visiting all sponsor companies for your chance to win. The drawing for the trip will take place today at 2 p.m. on the exhibit floor. Please arrive at 1.55. You must be present to win.